Welcome to today's program, and I have a dear friend from many years ago who is Rick Wakeman. Rick, thank you for being on the program. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're dead right. We go back, oh crikey, 1967, 68, something like that, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. Which is, oh crikey, 50 plus years, really. <laughs> it's 50 years, yeah, we've known each other. It was pretty amazing. I, I was just working uh, on a little newspaper in uh, West London and one of my jobs was to go around trying to find stories from different people and I turned up at a little rather dusty old second hand music store and yeah. it was run by Uncle Ernie. And Dave um, Sims, remember the name of the David, shop? David Sims, yeah, the Musical Bargain Centre. Well done, well done either. Yeah, it was a great, it was a great shop run by two guys, Dave Sims, who eventually ended up making Sims Watts uh, equipment amps, which are very collectible now. In fact, Trevor Rabin, the drummer in the band in, uh, that, I'm, that I'm in, has one which he absolutely adores. That's by the by. And I used to, to hang around in the shop because it was full of musical instruments and full of really nice guys and musicians coming in. Uh, I, I'd sort of skip off from school <laughs> and sort of, uh, sort of pop in because it was either that or sort of British Constitution A level lessons, and I thought I didn't fancy that. So I'd go to the music shop, and you turned up one day. Yeah, it was and you were desperate for a story because yeah. you had nothing. You had, I think you had a flower show or something, <laughs> and somebody had, had run over a tortoise, and that yeah. was about it. <laughs> well, I remember Uncle Ernie said, I've got an interesting story. He said, I used to pretend to play instruments That's for right. the big band. Tell us about Uncle Ernie first. Uncle Ernie, bless him, no longer with us. Uh, well, if he were alive, he'd be about 140. <laughs> Ernie was. was absolutely brilliant he was he was a kind man who basically uh, he used to go into the music shop into Dave's shop and just look around and do things and and, and Dave said he could never understand why he kept coming he never bought anything or did anything and he'd come in quite early in the morning and leave late in the afternoon and uh, and he said one day there was something and they needed something moved around and he said oh, I'll do it I'll help you so Uncle Ernie as we lovingly call him started moving his stuff around and and Dave had a couple of customers he said I've got to make some coffee he said I'll make the coffee I'll do the things mm. so you know, you know Dave was just turning to him and he said what, what 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 do you do and he said oh I I, I don't do anything I'm so, I'm sort of retired and Dave said oh he said well do you want a part-time job doing some stuff he said yes please <laughs> So he started working for Dave. He was the most loyal, kind man. It turned out that he'd lost his job and he didn't have the heart to tell his wife because he'd worked all his life, but he was now too old to get it. So he would leave in the morning and then come back at night and he would do anything just to get a few, a few pounds to, to go home because he mm. was his pride with his wife. And uh, so Dave gave him a job and his wife got an inkling that something was wrong. I think she phoned up where he used to work, and they said it didn't work here, and followed him into the, into the music shop. Uh, and he was out the back, and she saw Dave and said, is my husband Ernie here? And Dave cottoned on immediately what had happened. He was a kind man. He said, oh, yeah, he said, Ernie work, works here. He works for me. Works. He's a very valuable you know, part, you know, member of the staff. Very member, valuable member of the staff. He was the only staff. It was the <laughs> only one, only one there. And she went, oh, and uh, and then Ernie came out looking a bit shocked. She said, oh, you didn't tell me you were working here now, Ernie, yeah. full time. And he said, well, I, 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 I didn't know how you'd take me working in a music shop. She said, oh, I think it's lovely. <laughs> so Dave did one of the most compassionate, kind things ever yeah. with Ernie and Ernie was so loyal to Dave right up until the day he died yeah um, and we all loved Uncle Ernie yeah but he used to look out for stories for you yeah well when I came in I could hear you I didn't know who you were then playing keyboard what was the keyboard you were playing I was playing they had a Vox Continental organ in there double manual uh, which if anybody's got one they want to sell me I'd love one of those they were they were great great fun Vox Continental and I was just playing it for a, for, a, for a bit of fun. The year, I can tell you the year, it was 1969. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about quite early, early summer 1969. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, Ernie said, I've got a story. And it was, it was the Space Oddity story, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, what, what he did, I said, D does, because uh, he said, you, I think you were then called Ricky Wakeman. Yeah, I'd, I had a girlfriend at the time called Jane. 
who, who called me Ricky. Yeah. Because uh, probably my mum was Chris and Richard. Yeah. But uh, she liked all the American um, singers like Ricky Nelson and yeah. Ricky Valance and that, so I became Ricky. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember you came out and I asked where you lived and found out you were in a circulation area. Yeah. And I, I remember you learning that you were studying at the Royal College of Music, but you were doing sessions. Yeah. And I think you mentioned two of them. I think one was with Cat Stevens and one with David Bowie. Uh, Tell the, us about it. The, the Cat Stevens one came later. I'd done some sessions with Cat Stevens, but it was the David Bowie one because Space Oddity was uh, in the top ten at the time. And I played on that. And I said, well, I was only a session guy playing the Mellotron. And you said, you said something like, it doesn't matter. It's more interesting than the flower show. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it, was the, it, it was really the equivalent of there's that wonderful expression, which you know in, in England in the, amongst the uh, newspaper industry, which no longer is it, which was drop the dead donkey, <laughs> which was uh, w when, um, it, w when a, a news story came in at the last minute for a front page, yeah. uh, the editor, if he had time, would f phone the printers. Right. And the, 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 the saying down the phone was, drop the dead donkey, we've got a new headline and <laughs> yeah, things. Yeah. So uh, I, I began to realise that not a lot happened in the Middlesex County <laughs> Times, really, did it? Well, eventually, um, after the story ran, um, something like Ricky Wakeman is watching the charts or something. Yeah, was right, yeah. Something like that. And, and you invited me round to your home in Northolt, which is a part of the area, and played the piano for me. That's and right. I was absolutely astonished, but I was thrilled to find out that we were both Christians. Yeah. And you had gone to which church? I was at, um, uh, I was at, sorry, that, that's, that's not uh, Dan Weezing, by the way. <laughs> that's a lovely dog called Sasha, belongs to a great friend of mine who's, <laughs> who's down there. Uh, I'm sure you get a shot of him later anyway. <laughs> Actually looks a bit like you, Dan, to be honest. The, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, my, uh, in fact, here he is, here I say. My, um, hello, mate. Oh, look at that. My, he's, uh, he's got a big bulldog there that he's scratching. No. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was Dan. Uh, oh look, you're a lovely Sash. The um, uh, yeah, my father was a uh, Baptist, did some mm -hmm. lay preaching and that as well at at uh, at, uh, at Hammersmith, um, uh, the the Baptist church there, which sadly no longer exists. They knocked it down, which which was a great shame. And my mother was a very strict Methodist and was right till the, the day she, she died. Uh, so they went to separate churches. Mum went yeah. to the Methodist church and Dad went to the Baptist church in, in Hammersmith. And, uh, but it was, it was deemed too far for me to go up to Hammersmith as a young boy. So I was sent to uh, South Harrow Baptist Church, which I still have connections with, uh, which I love, which is about a, a 20 minute walk from my house through the, through the park down to the church. And I have to say, considering how, how um, you know, really quite strong Christians in every respect my mum and dad were, uh, I was never forced to go to the, the mm. church. Uh, I mean, my dad always used to say to me, if you don't enjoy it, doesn't, you don't have to go. Mm. You know, he never believed in forcing the issue of making you do something. But I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And, and for, oh, at least, I suppose, until I was, in bands I started touring and got married and moved out of the area, I suppose for at least 14, 15 years, that, that church was a major, major part of my, my life and, uh, and made lots of friends and still have friends from the area. We talked a little bit about Morning Has Broken and yeah. I understand you played quite a role in that but you had trouble getting paid. Yeah, I did. I'm not going to tell you the story because I tell it on stage, but that's very true. I did. Uh, I, uh, it wasn't Cat Stevens' fault, and I did get paid eventually about 30 odd years later. <laughs> uh, in, fact, in fact, 40 years odd later, I got I got paid for doing that. Incidentally, with Morning Has Broken, which I did with Cat Stevens, as you know, which was great fun to do. Um, I, I've given a plug. I've just re-recorded it with uh, a, a lovely 16-year-old girl singer. Um, um, and it's it, it, she's um, uh, a Catholic girl. I met the family um, through a friend of mine mm -hmm. who said, you must hear this young girl sing. And this is when she was 14. Yeah. And I heard her sing and had the, the soprano voice to die for. I mean, just 
Mm. Naturally beautiful voice. And uh, so last year we recorded Welcome a Star with her as a Christmas single. And we've just done Morning Has Broken, which comes out, um, well, it's out it's out now, actually, ready for Christmas, which, done, which she's done a great job. And one of the things that it was really important to me, I've never thought of doing it, doing either of those tracks again since, because it's too many pieces recorded sometimes for the wrong reason, especially around Christmas time. But uh, um, Emmy, Emmy Becker, Emmy is her name. Emmy and her family, her parents, are very, very devout Catholics mm. and heavily involved with their church, heavily involved with, and so um, when I played Emmy the songs and she really wanted to do them um, because they mean something to her. Mm. And I feel that's very important. I think sometimes, you know, tracks are recorded, whether it be Morning Is Broken or, or whatever it might be, um, just because they're nice songs and they're nice tunes. I think they always come across better when the person actually singing them or taking part believes in what they're singing or playing. Right. So, now, what about David Bowie? Because I know mm. you were heartbroken when he passed away, but yeah. you went to see him. Did you call it Beckingham Palace, was it? Yeah, his house, Beckingham. Beckingham. I, I, we were great. For, I mean, uh, I mean, I went to see him after I did Space Oddity with him. I spent time at his house uh, putting Hunky Dory together, the piano parts and that, which was which was great than doing that. Um, but even more telling apart from that was uh, it's not documented much, but he and I were neighbours for four years oh. in Switzerland. Uh, I say neighbours, we both lived up the same mountain. So we, <laughs> used, to, we used to meet up a lot when mm. we, we were back. So I got to know him very, very well as the person. And uh, he, he lived for music, he cared about things, he cared about people, and he was a doer. Mm. He, didn't like, he didn't like could-haves, as he called them. People said, oh, I could have done that. Because <laughs> he's asked me, well, why didn't you? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, and he always been like, you know, if you've got something you want to do, and like, do it. Because, you know, the, the, the longer you think about it, the less chances you'll ever have of, of, of doing it. Mm. He was a very interesting man. I knew he was ill. I had no idea how ill he was. Mm. Um, and uh, it was interesting after he died, I got, I did so many TV and radio program about which was very difficult because it's, it's all very well on the first couple of programs uh, to be genuinely sincere but afterwards you start repeating yourself and you mm. go hold a minute you know I am sincere but I'm saying the same thing again now <laughs> time, time, time. Yeah. but I did um, I did Life on Mars on the Simon Mayo uh, drive time show in the UK which is the biggest drive time program because about nine ten million listeners and uh, he, um, uh, Simon Mayer was really good. I played it live on there and they did a webcam of it. And in two days it had um, uh, two million hits, mm. which was ludicrous. <laughs> and loads of people said, you've got to record it for a charity. Now I don't like charity records. Most of them lose money and, uh, and invariably done for the wrong reason. But I thought this was a good idea. So I recorded it as a piano version um, and with the, uh, all the royalties going to Macmillan Cancer Care. Mm. And it was number one for about six weeks. Did yeah. it, it did incredibly well. And uh, and I felt that was justified. I felt it would be something that David would have approved of. Right. It was very sad, but you know, one of the things is that you start to learn. I mean, you and I were talking earlier about the number of people that we've lost over the last year or so. And uh, it, it's what's interesting is I look back at those people and virtually all of, the, all of them have left something behind yeah and one of the things is when you do pass on I mean yes the, 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 the good Lord takes your spirit he takes your body or well, that goes back in wherever it is depending on whether you're a burner or a barrier but he, <laughs> that, that but he doesn't take what you leave behind mm. you know so you know, the great thing about people, it, and it doesn't mean, it does not just for artists leaving behind music, which will live forever, or, they, or, or if you're a writer, or whatever, but you always, everybody leaves something. Mm. Everybody leaves something, and uh, you know, one of the things that I've learned, and I say to people when they lose things, you know, live with the memories, because yeah. 
They're never taken away. He leaves right. them here. You know, they're left for you. Yeah. We're speaking with Rick Wakeman. Uh, this is a very interesting time. We've been friends for about 50 years. And um, Rick has joined and rejoined Yes several times and uh, is now on a rather extraordinary tour with himself, John Anderson, and Trevor Rabin. And uh, it's, is it a mu it's an evening of, of Yes music? It's something John and I decided to do without going into long, boring details. In 2005, when we did the last Yes tour, when I was in the band and John was in the band, John was then very ill. I mean, he was far more ill than was ever released to the press. In fact, uh, his, his lovely wife Jane found him, clapped at the bottom of the gun, and he was dead when the paramedics arrived. And they had to bring him back to life. They, uh, he had some serious operations. He was very, very ill, and it was genuinely touch and go whether he would survive, um, which was very upsetting for those of us that, 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 that knew. Um, it was obvious that it would be quite some time before John could get his strength back and, and work and do whatever. Um, to cut a long story short, the other guys in the band wanted to carry on. And I said I was not prepared to carry on without John because I felt, A, it was wrong, it was disrespectful, and I couldn't see a yes band without John singing. It just, it, it's like having a Led Zeppelin without, um, Robert, Plant. without Robert Plant or The Who without Roger Daughtry or you know, uh, it, you can go on forever with, with, with bands and things like that. And I said I wasn't prepared to do it. So they went off and, and toured anyway, at which, I, I'll be honest, it, 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 it both upset and bewildered me that, it could, that that could happen. And John and I stayed in touch, and as you slowly got stronger and better, we did, um, we did a duo album together. We wanted to get back to basics, and we did a semi-acoustic album, which was virtually an acoustic album, really, called The Living Tree which we absolutely love. Um, we're really proud of it. We did three tours, two in England and one in, in America, where we toured it. Very simple show, just the pair of us. It was getting back to basics, mm -hmm. where we said to, to try and almost re, 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 retread where we'd been and, 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 and remember why we were, what we were and what we were doing. And all the time we were doing that, we were talking about what would we want to do next. People said, oh, we love this album, do another one. And we went, no, no, th this is it, we've done this. This is what we wanted to do. There's no follow-up to The Living Tree. The Living Tree is what it is. Um, it's a statement and something that we're very proud of. There isn't a second one. Uh, but we realised we wanted to do something else, but we both agreed what we wanted to do was to do Yes Music as we felt it should be, uh, which obviously meant John singing. Um, and there was only one guitarist we wanted, which was Trevor. Obviously, Trevor Raven, who was through those great glory years, wrote Owner of a Lonely Heart and all the big hits. And Trevor and I had become great friends when we did the Union tour, and he'd also played on my Return to the Centre of the Earth album. And we'd, we'd always vowed we would play together. The difficulty was, we'd all agree, we all went, we said, yeah, absolutely, we've got to do this, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. But I was really busy doing my own stuff in, uh, in, in Europe and whatever, in South America. John was very busy doing his solo stuff and guesting here and there with everybody. And Trev, yeah. who's done something like about 80 or 90 film scores, very big Hollywood film score writer, we're all just ludicrously busy. And then I suppose the catalyst came we kept saying, yeah, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And then Chris Squire died. Mm. And that, I suppose, really made the neon light that said mortality shine even brighter. We went, oh, hold on a minute. If we don't do this now, maybe we'll never do it. So we talked on the phone with each, we said, do we want to do this? We went, yes, we really do want to do this. <laughs> and it's important we do this. And lots of Yes fans said, please do this. Yeah. So we went, right, that's it. So we wanted to put together a good, good band. So we, I brought in Lee Pomeroy, who's the bass player, who is, uh, I think he's the finest bass player in the world. He is absolutely amazing. Heavily inspired by Chris Squire, uh, but he's taken it to a new level. Wonderful guy. And everybody loves him. And the fans have gone nuts for him. And there was a drummer called Lee Molino III, who was a great friend of Trevor Raymond, who used a lot, who oh, is outstanding. So we put together this band, we started rehearsing in August. We decided that, uh, this was about a year and a half ago, that 
all the work that we each had in our diaries we would do but we would take no more after that which turned out to be around about July 2016. So we all got together then in August we started rehearsing and then through into September started the tour in October and it is it's an evening of yes music um, and more and it's uh, it's been wonderful the only thing that we all realize is we're no spring chickens anymore uh, very funny. I mean, John's 72 I think I'm uh, 67 Trevor's the baby at 62 but the uh, you know, it's an 11 week tour and that's that's hard when you're in your 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. So we've we've all been sort of trying to be as sensible as possible against, but yeah. we've all caught colds and various things. But we don't have technicians anymore. We have carers, <laughs> and uh, it would sort of like look after us. But yeah. it's been musically, this is far and away the finest form of yes lineup I've ever been in. Right. Yes. And you've got your old manager back, I understand, Brian Lane. Uh, Brian Lane, yeah, Brian Lane, who had the original yes, looked after everything, and in fact, looked after me uh, for all of the 70s. And then Brian and I uh, got back together. We've always kept in touch. We've had, we've sort of had at least one or two lunches a year to reminisce and laugh. And Brian went heavily into the classical world, looked after Catherine Jenkins and a lot of big classical people, and did it very, very well for himself. Um, but he came back and started looking after me in, in 2013, when I was doing the big Journey concerts again in England, and the people who were putting it together at the time were making a complete mess of it. Mm. And we had a lunch, and he said, they're mucking it up. And I said, I know. He said, look, I, I was part of the original. I don't want to see it mucked up. Uh, do you want me to take it over for you? I said, yes. <laughs> and he took it over and turned it into a monster success and uh, and it's carried on ever since and when this the ARW thing came together um, uh, the lads all said to me John and they said we need a, a good manager and I said Brian and they went Brian never thought of Brian <laughs> I said well he's done a fantastic job for me and I think there's only one person who could do the right yeah. job for this man and he's come in and he has he's done a great job and everybody's been very happy. So it's a good team. That's wonderful. Well, we're about to close. We've been talking with Rick Wakeman. And Rick, how can people listening to this pray for you? What are some of the needs that you have? Oh, we've got a lot. There's never no shortage. <laughs> um, there's, <laughs> there's, no, there's no shortage. I think the, I don't think anybody ever says prayers for anybody else or anybody uh, and go, not quite sure what to do today. There's always <laughs> something. You know, it's interesting as you get older, so much um, revolves around health. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there, there's a lot of health issues in, in, in our family. Uh, my lovely wife, Rachel, her, her father's just, uh, he, he was diagnosed with advanced kidney cancer. They just removed a, a kidney with a big tumor on it. He's 80 years old. Um, He's very funny because he's got very early signs of, of dementia. Of course, after big operations, you get a bit befuddled at times. And um, my wife was in to see him in the hospital just just a day ago, and uh, and he was convinced because his his, his bowels aren't working yet that they'd mucked up the hospital the, the operation and taken his bottom away, which was <laughs> quite quite sweet. See, but he's he he he'll need a lot because he's got a lot of healing and that to be done. And what's uh, his name? Is David. David. David Kaufman and his wife Pat, who's 79, who's absolutely wonderful. She's been in, in Ill, Ill health recently, and of course it's tough on her, and it's tough, it's tough on Rachel, my, my lovely wife, because uh, uh, I'm not there. Yeah. And it's very very hard. You want to be there, but she knows why I'm here. I'm here to help the family do things, so that's difficult. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in, in the direct family as well, um, Adam, my son, has had has had heart difficulties and still has, so he's always in our, our prayers. I, uh, uh, my um, uh, eldest boy son, Oliver, he has uh, a lovely little girl called Lottie who's badly autistic. Mm. So we, you know, obviously got prayers for her, but we're, we're, we're not unique. Yeah. Every family, everybody you talk, I, I, I doubt whether you can stop anybody in the street and there isn't somebody in their family that has got health issues and, and yeah. health problems. And I think a lot of it is obviously not when, for the, uh, things like children or whatever, but I think there's so much that um, medical science has almost created a rod for its own back. Yeah. We're all living longer. 
I mean, if 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 you and I, when we were talking way back in 1968 or whatever it was, had sort of talked about, oh yeah, well in 2016 we'll <laughs> be sitting in a hotel room in uh, in oh, Los Angeles. Yeah. You, you go. Well, one of us will be dead. You know. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Yeah. It's so true. it's to some extent, medical science has created a role for itself because I, I'm very glad we do, but we were never intended to live this long. <laughs> we do cheat. Yeah. We do cheat quite a lot. So everybody that you know has sort of health health difficulties. Sure. You, it's so uh, it's having to work overtime up there. <laughs> Well, Rick, you've got a website people can go to? Yeah, it's rwcc.com, and I've got a, a silly Twitter, yeah. which is at Grumpy Old Rick, with Grumpy Old and Rick with capital letters. <laughs> yeah, at Grumpy Old Rick, that's yeah. a funny Twitter. There is a, a Facebook page, or, uh, which, I, which is run in conjunction with the website. I mean, I don't, I don't go on it, I don't, yeah. you know, um, but it, it's sort of run by the website, but yeah. the website, monitor very well run by a wonderful guy called Wayne Smith in Seattle uh, that's great fun well we've been speaking to Rick Wakeman how wonderful after all these years 50 years I'm amazed you remember my name <laughs> <laughs> and I know many people from Calvary Costa Mesa will remember your Absolutely. two concerts there. I remember yeah uh, I was very saddened when when we lost Chuck when yeah. Chuck Smith died having said that you know I go back to what we were talking about earlier Look what he's left behind. Yeah, you know that's that's the great. You know it, that's that. It's what you leave that can't be taken away. I think people sometimes, yes, it's it, it is. It's a shame when you lose somebody because you no longer can spend time with them. You can't be them. They're not there. Yeah. But I think something we should focus more on what what they've left for us. Sure. You know that's and and certainly. Uh, Every time you pass the Calvary Chapel, they wouldn't be there if it weren't for Chuck Smith. Right, right. Rick Wakeman, great to see you again. And um, we ask people to pray for Rick. You know, this is a very exhausting tour. And thank you again for being on the program. Do I look that tired? <laughs> That's very kind. And I tell you, I tell you and pray for this guy as well, because he's very, very special. Many, many years, isn't it, mate? Many years. And yeah. uh, you talk about films and things that you, you want to make. And I've said this for years. Somebody should make a film about this guy's life. And if anybody's watching, ask him about Idi Amin. <laughs> didn't like you, did he? Yeah, no, he didn't like me. And uh, <laughs> I wrote a book about him, and I think he was quite unhappy. Yeah, well, you said you, you told him he wasn't a very nice man. No, that was true. Yeah. Didn't they put you in prison in Uganda? No, that was in Nigeria. I got oh, was it Nigeria? Up. Oh, it was Nigeria you went to prison. Yeah, yeah, they didn't. They, you told them they were very nasty, didn't you? They didn't like that. And I remember I phoned his wife up. No, that's right, it was Nigeria. And I said, uh, Where's Dad? She said, He's in prison. <laughs> I said, aren't you worried? He said, no, he always gets out. <laughs> Rick Wakeman, thank you. Thanks, Dad. <laughs>